praise the Lord for this opportunity. It is such a joy um, to lead worship in this fashion. And I, I want to share with you guys just a little history of what Carrie and I have walked through and what we experienced in me proposing to this lovely young lady down here. Uh, we were down at Texas A&M, and we had been in a relationship for a year, and we, are cel- we had just celebrated at dinner, and we had gifts to exchange. And so we go back to my place, and I've got a stool set up, and I have her sit down, and I'm reading her some verbiage that uh, just talking about how blessed I was and what I felt like the Lord was doing in our, in our relationship. And then all of a sudden, I am overcome. Something hits me, and I'm like, Carrie, I'll be right back. And I, I excuse myself, and Carrie's thinking, man, his stomach is getting torn up right now. But instead, I actually creep over to my roommate's room, and I fall on my face. And I'm like, Lord, no way. No, not right now. Surely you can't be wanting me to do this right here. No. You want me to ask Carrie's hand in marriage? And then what I experienced in that moment were thoughts of fear. What are her friends going to say? I don't have a ring. We don't, this isn't going to jive, Lord. No, what, and this isn't in my timing. What, this, isn't, this isn't going to work out. So as I processed those emotions and was very unsettled in what felt like eternity and wondering what Carrie's thinking, the Lord begins to remind me of things that he has done in my life, the way that he brought me, the fact that I was even there attending college. The fact that he had brought this young lady along to me and had cultivated just this amazing friendship and relationship. He began to remind me of things that I had learned about him through teachings and preachings and what his word said. And I couldn't help but move forward in obeying the Lord. And so I walked back in the room and I share with Carrie my heart and what I feel like the Lord's doing. I ask her hand in marriage, and it has been an amazing provision of the Lord in our relationship. And I feel like that's what we're going to experience this morning as we study Deuteronomy 8. That God was speaking through Moses. He was saying, look, as you walk through the wilderness, as you head into the promised land, I want you to remember who I am and allow that obedience and that remembering to result in obedience in your lives as you obey my commands. So if you will, let's, let's go to Deuteronomy 8. We're going to be hitting this entire chapter. And as y'all are turning there, I want us to, to know that Moses' heart and passion for God's people is to remember the Lord for all he did through the wilderness as they head into the promised land. And this remembrance results in obedience because we'll see later at the end of this chapter that if they don't follow through this, with this remembering, that there is going to be a consequence for this disobedience and forgetfulness. Let's begin reading in verse 1. All the commandments that I'm commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you, just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. Now if you'll remember with me up until this point, God has chosen this people group. These people who were enslaved to the Egyptians, he has brought them out of bondage. And we see his heart for this people. Just a previous chapter over in chapter 7, when he says in verse 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. And out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Check this out. 
The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh. God shows that he is keeping his promise, his covenant to the forefathers in the way that he rescues them. And he does this out of the love that he has for them. And we see also, as Tim preached several Sundays ago as he was walking through Deuteronomy 4, that God is doing this to bring honor and glory to his name in chapter 4, verse 6. Surely this great nation is a, that, that the, the peoples that they would look into the nation of Israel and they'd say these things. Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call him? And so God rescues the people. He brings them out. They're they're cruising through. They come into this promised land, the land of Canaan, and they encounter these people, the Canaanites. And they, man, they're, they're doubting. Fear overcomes them. They forget the the promises that the Lord is going to give them this land. And as a result of their disobedience, they are to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And that brings us up to speed in verse 2 of chapter 8. And Moses is saying, You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. Now, we're going to encounter this word remember a couple more times, and I want us to think about it in the context of Deuteronomy and having this definition. We remember, we look back at something in the past, we bring it into the present, and it positively affects the way that we respond. So we look at something in the past, bring it into the present, and it positively affects the way that we move forward. Much like my engagement to Carrie, the Lord reminded me of how he had been faithful. He reminded me of who he was through his word. And in that moment, I responded in obedience to him and moved forward in proposing to her. Moses goes on to describe why the Israelites encountered the wilderness in the remaining part of verse 2. He says that God might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. Take note here that God, God does, or Moses doesn't document these words because, and say that God's going to humble and test and later even discipline him because God doesn't know how the, these people, his people are going to respond. He does it to reveal what, is, what their nature is, what their very heart is. And he does that through humbling them. He wants the people to see that they cannot rely in and of themselves, that God is much more important than they. He desires to bring about a test to reveal their true character, their motivation, and what their heart's desire is. And then later in verse 5, he brings about discipline to correct their unrighteous behavior. God is doing this to show them that they are to rely on him, that he is the God who is in control. And they are to come to him as the supreme authority. And the Israelites can really respond in one of two ways. They can respond in remembering the Lord and moving forward in obedience to all his commands. Or they can forget the Lord or they will forget the Lord and disobey his commands. Moses reminds them of all that God has done just to help them in this remembering process. He says, hey, peeps, you guys remember what God has done back here in the wilderness? Let let me just toss a couple of these things out at you. You check this out. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna. What? God allowed their hunger, the, the hunger pains, and this physical need to draw attention to the fact that God was going to speak into existence the very sustenance that would provide the food and the physical strength that they would need through manna. Man does not live on bread alone, 
but on the very word of the Lord. God speaks this provision into existence, and he just provides for them. Moses continues on this, this helping remember the Lord process, where he says, Nor, uh, Your clothing did not wear out on you. Um, and I, I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, after a couple of years of wearing some of my shirts, just the, with how I'm created, uh, it's not even really usable to take to goodwill. And so these peeps aren't coming out of slavery carrying loads and loads and loads of clothing, but the Lord miraculously provides for them for this material need, and he allows their clothing to be sustained for that entire 40 years. Amazing. And then he goes, Moses goes on to say that your feet, your footsies did not swell during these 40 years. This people, their mobility depended on their feet. When the Lord's presence moved, they moved. God did not allow their feet to swell. He's providing even for this, this physical need in keeping them healthy. And later we'll see in verse 15 and 16 that God protects them as they encounter fiery serpents and scorpions in a dry land that is literally soaking up the water because of its thirst. God wanted them to know that he was in control. I think that's a similar message that we need to hear this morning, that God is in control, and we need to remember that. There was a time when Carrie and I were first coming to visit Southside. We were guest worship leading, coming into a new environment. That Sunday morning we had come to be with a worship team and we had walked through practice. So we're gearing up, getting saddled up and ready to go for the service. And a little bit before the service starts, all the lights go out. The power is completely gone. So I'm looking at Carrie and uh, we're like, well, okay, all right, let's do this. And in the moment, what could have been anxiety, and I definitely felt out of control, but knowing that I was not in control, I could have responded to disobedience and just start freaking out. But the fact of the matter was that God was going to be worshiped that morning. And I could rest and remember of the ways that he had already been preparing myself and Carrie and the rest of the team to handle situations like this and so in the moment we responded in obedience and just said Lord you're in control you've got this you will be worshiped today and we move forward in obedience sure enough Lord cranked on the lights again we were good to go and most peeps didn't even realize what had happened and we worshiped him I want us to note that what we see about God here in the Old Testament through Moses is congruent with what we see in the New Testament. God demands worship. He demands our worship. And he will bring about testing. He will bring about humility. He may bring situations in our life where we've got to remember who he is and trust in him. God can use things like authority figures and famines and droughts and deaths and illnesses to, to cause us to remember of who he is, what he's done, what his word says about him, and hopefully allow us to, in the present, move forward in humble obedience to him and keep his commands. He wraps up this first little section with verse 6 when he says, Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and fear him. God was speaking through Moses, commanding his people to look back, to observe all that God had done, to remember those things, to bring them into the present and let it produce obedience in their hearts to all his commands. And God also wanted them to remember him as they headed into the promised land. Some of them headed into the promised land. Let's look at verse 7 through 9. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, 
a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Did you catch a contrast? I mean, we're talking about the wilderness over here, and God was in control for sure over here in the wilderness. But man, they, they lacked, in the wilderness, they lacked water. They lacked food. They were fa- facing these, these serpents and scorpions that were really uh, a really sticky, hairy situation. And now we hear a little description of the promised land. God is going to provide an abundant source of water, three resources of water, fountains and springs and brooks of water. He's going to provide foods, grains, and fruits, olive oil, and honey. They will be without need. They will be satisfied. They will have stones and iron. God is going to provide amazingly. He was in control in the wilderness, and he will be in control as they enter into the promised land. And he wants them to remember that as they experience these provisions, they are to look to the Lord their God and give him praise Look in verse 10. Moses says, we have two B's. We are to bless and beware. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. He says, man, some of you have experienced the stark contrast of the wilderness. And and when you enter into this land, you must be careful that you see all that God has done and give praise where praise is due. Give God thanksgiving. Bless his holy name for all that God is doing. And he says in verse 11, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. I I just love how God is speaking through Moses. This this is an event that's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. And God's calling him out through speaking through Moses and saying, beware that you don't forget. Did you notice the difference in verse 11 compared to verse 2 and the fact that he uses this little preposition by keeping his commands? It shows us the link between remembering the Lord and obeying the Lord. This is crucial. They are going to show their loyalty and obedience to the Lord by their actions, by what they carry out and their obedience to the commandments, those things that God had said, you shall do this, you shall not do that. Through the ordinances, those legal responses, the things that they were carrying out in the judicial systems and the the statutes, the prescribed way that God was setting forth, that they were orchestrating in and among the leaders. They were to keep these three things to show that they are remembering the Lord. It's much like you and I, when we have authority figures in our life, we show our loyalty and our obedience to them in the way that we respond to their instruction. This is the same thing that Moses is saying. Don't forget the Lord your God by not keeping the commandments. Instead, remember the Lord and obey all that he has instructed you to do. In the same way that they were to let their obedience be a product of their remembering that God is bringing about all of these things in the promised land, we too are to remember the Lord and let our obedience be a product of our remembering Him and all that He has done in our lives. Why did Moses stress that they are to bless the Lord and beware not to forget Because God knew their hearts. God was issuing this warning before they even experienced it because he knew what would happen when they tasted of the honey and all, all of his provision. And we see that in this next section. Beginning in verse 12. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied... And have built good houses and lived in them. And when your herds and flocks multiply, your silver and your gold multiplies, and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God 
who brought you out, out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water out for you out of the rock of the flint. In the wilderness, he fed you with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and he might test you to do good for you in the end. Otherwise, you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand have made me this wealth. This just blows me away. I shared several Sundays ago that, man, when I look at the Israelites' response, I just think, man, are you guys crazy fools? What, do you not see what the Lord has done and moving forward? How can you do this? How can you respond? Have they not remembered, are they not going to remember all the ways in which God has provided for them and protected him, them and the way that he was in control the entire time? But you see what happens in verse 14? Moses says, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. They'll say things like verse 17, look at what I've done by my own power and my own strength I have done all this. Pride and forgetfulness will cloud their vision. God would reveal their hearts. He knew that they had to experience this all along. Did you catch in verse 16 that he says he did this for their good? God desires for them to look to him, recognize that he is in control, that he is the provider, he is the sustainer, he is the protector. He desires for them to honor and bless and glorify his name. But pride and forgetfulness will creep in if they forget all that the Lord has done and they do not obey his commands. I'd love to say that my heart's not any different than these people from 3,000 years ago, but the fact of the matter is I struggle with that too. Our hearts are not any different than theirs. When we taste and see things of provision in God, in, that God does in our life, there are times when pride will creep in and cloud our vision. Pride creeps in just like any other sin. It starts slow, generally unrecognizable. And if it goes untouched or unconfessed, it gradually works its ways into every nook and cranny of our lives and affects the way that we respond to the Lord. Um, I got the opportunity to go, Carrie and I got the opportunity to go with the college students on a canoeing trip, and uh, we were really looking forward to it. This was our opportunity to get to hang out with the college students, get to meet some of them. And uh, so here we are, we're cruising down the river, and I, I, I can't remember if I'm in a kayak or canoe, but regardless, we're, we're about to come around this corner, and I'm thinking, cool, let's, let's take it. All of a sudden, the bottom drops out from me. We nosedive. I go in the water. I come out. My glasses just fly off me. The cyanar glasses down the river, and I come up. I'm as blind as a bat. And so I enjoy the rest of the retreat, uh, <laughs> probably squinting a lot and making sure that I did not drive those vans back home. And, he, and uh, what I learned were those glasses were a little bit more important in my life than what I even knew. These little metal frames with glasses, with, with, uh, with glass, had become an idol in my life. I didn't even realize it, but pride had crept in, unannounced. So when these things were gone, a couple days later, I'm thinking, how am I going to be cool? There's no way. I can't even show my face anymore. What am I going to do? What am I going to do to my hair or, or something else to be cool? This isn't going to work. And the Lord showed me. He graciously showed me that pride had crept into my life with these things. Even in that little example, pride was tainting and clouding my vision. God wanted me to look to him for all that recognition that I would receive. Hey, Kurt, those glasses are pretty cool. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, feed me, feed me. God wanted me to 
get my adoration and love from the Lord. But instead, those little guys have become a source of pride and have become an idol in my life. If the sin of pride can contribute to us forgetting God and falling into disobedience, how in the world do we we keep this pride and forgetfulness away from us. One word that Moses shares, remember. It's not an easy task. Um, it, but I want to draw attention to the fact that many of us, as we experience events in our lives, we want to remember these things. As you have something cool, you want to, oh man, I got to document that. Oh yeah, I want to, I want to remember that. I want my... I want to pass this down. I want my kiddos to remember that. We have different ways that we remember events in our lives. I've got, I've got a list of just a couple. We use Facebook timeline. We use emails and videos and CDs, letters and blogs for some, cassette tapes, VHSs, records and journals and diaries, stories, families, reunions, pictures. Some of you remember things by journaling. I totally wish that I could journal. I've tried many times just to sit down and be, oh, I'm going to keep this journal cool, lock and key, Man, fail. I'm not good with a journal. But one thing that has worked with our little fam in remembering what God has done and helping steer us away from pride and forgetfulness, we've got a little eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper posted on the fridge. And uh, we do as we do every day. We eat all day long. And, but the great thing about this is, is it's positioned on the fridge. I see the things that are marked on there and the things that we have written down of what God has done. And it just triggers memories. Scripture we'll put on there. Lord gives us a gift card through a friend. Lord takes care of a lawn. He takes care. He, he provides a good doctor's visit. We're writing these things down to remind us of all that God is doing. We're looking back at what God has done and who he is. We remember it in the day. And let me tell you, I walk away from that little eight and a half sheet of paper and just move, do my best to move forward in obedience to the Lord. But it just helps generate those thoughts about what God is doing and what he has done in our lives. Remembering the Lord helps steer us away from pride and forgetfulness. Because in verse 18, Moses shares that you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you the power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is to today. And then he goes on into 19 and 20, saying, It shall come about, if you ever forget the Lord your God, and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you today that you will surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish. Because you would not listen to the voice of the Lord your God. God, God is speaking to Moses and Moses is saying, look, if you, if you do these things, if you get into the promised land and you forget all that God has done, if you do this, you will perish. You will be destroyed. Well, what does that mean? They will be destroyed like the nations. Some of the nations that God has dealt with previously, back in chapter 2, King Sion says this, listen to this. The Lord, your God, Lord our God delivered him over to us, us being the nation of Israel. And we defeated him and his sons and all his people. So we captured all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the children of every city. We left no survivors. If you forget the Lord you, and not obey his commands, you will perish like this nation. Later in chapter 3, the kingdom of Og. We see it being described, so the Lord our God delivered Og also, king of Bashan, with all his people into our hand, and we smote them until there was no survivor left. God delivered the kingdom of Og, 60 cities, into the hands of the Israelites, and they perished. Not one survivor God wanted his people to obey and remember his, 
all of what he has done and his promises of bringing them into the promised land. But if they didn't, they were going to perish like these nations. Now, I want to be very clear this morning. God abhors pride. He detests idolatry. And he will punish those who live in this sin. But I want to remind us of what he's doing and why he's doing this. He has drawn out this people who were enslaved. He heard their cries. He showed the love and the passion that he had for this people as he rescued them. And he desires for them as they move forward to walk and remember his provision and to obey him and all his commands. Does this sound familiar? God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give him as an offering so that all who would believe in him would be adopted and welcomed into the family and become his people. That he would provide for them and nurture them. That we and those who believe in Christ would have an eternal worship experience with him in heaven, a place that is like nothing else here on earth. We are to remember the Lord our God in all that we do. And we are to walk forward in obedience to him. My church family, one of the greatest concerns that I have for us is that when we are experiencing very little or we feel helpless and broken and beaten down and left alone and stranded, that we would fail to remember that he is the God in control. And he may be allowing things, tests and hunger to come into our lives, but that he is sovereignly providing and he wants us to move forward in humble obedience. I also have a concern that when we have plenty and God is blessing us richly, that we look around and we say, whoa, yeah, I'm doing this. We're doing this. And we forget all that God has done to bring us to this point. And we fail to move forward in humble obedience to him. We have the same message that Moses was sharing with the nation of Israel. Do not forget the Lord your God. Do not move forward in disobedience. God desires for us to remember all he's done. To obey his commands, to believe in him.